this bike came at a bad time for me. When I should have been riding a bunch of different test bikes from various other brands, I simply didn't want to stop riding the altitude. I just kept riding the Rocky Mountain and find myself enjoying it more and more. And now I'm so addicted to the long wheelbase, balanced carbon layup, and sprightly suspension that I'm looking for any excuse I can find to delay returning this loner test bike back to Rocky Mountain. As most of you know, a key supporter of my channel is the online retailer, Jensen USA. I had never before ridden a Rocky Mountain, so thanks to Jensen's support, I was able to get this bike before it came out, do an unboxing video, and now, Jensen has also supported me in bringing my review of this bike to all of you here. As always, I have an affiliate link over to Jensen USA down in the YouTube description below, where you can learn all about the various altitude models and price points and everything. Before we do get into my review of the Altitude, I want to let you know that I'm also supported by Industry 9, PNW Components, and Shimano. And we're coming at you live from Galbraith Mountain, where I like to do manuals and wheelies. To me, they're really one and the same. Internet debate. This bike has made me a bit of a hypocrite. After my huge wreck this past summer, I wanted to orient myself more towards shorter travel bikes and hardtails. The idea was to do more with less and hopefully avoid any more hospital visits. But the altitude quickly made me eat my words. Even when ridden in a less than extreme environment, I was still having a canoe load of fun. This is the longest travel Enduro bike I've ever spent much time on with 170 millimeter travel, Fox 38 fork, and 160 millimeters of rear travel. I came into this expecting the bike to be way too much bicycle for my needs. Long travel bikes can often end up being a real chore to get airborne. They can dumb down trails and remove the challenge of riding some of our favorite technical single tracks. This means you might have to go really extra super duper Jesse Melamed fast and huck mega crazy huge in order to have fun. Luckily, that hasn't exactly been the case. So maybe I'm not such a hypocrite after all. The geometry of the altitude had me a little intimidated at first. Mostly, the wheelbase is super long. It's the longest bike I've ever ridden. While I was expecting a canoe with a rowboat paddle type feel on tighter trails, it turned out the bike rode phenomenally well. More like a freestyle kayak but with a substantial safety margin. I think a big part of why I like this bike so much is the suspension design. The Horselink 4 bar is super traditional and it pedals well, but where it really shines is when it's time to get airborne. If you've seen my riding videos, you've probably noticed that I waste a great deal of time and energy hitting all sorts of goofy jumps. It's exceedingly easy to pop the Rocky off any and every bump in the trail. The bike has three geometry settings as well as three different suspension settings, and they call that the Ride 9 system. I just call it awesome, and I did a whole video about how I found the best setting for my own style. I missed it. Being able to get in the air and having the support of a slightly progressive suspension curve combined to give me more confidence on this bike than anything else I've ridden to date. Now, enough about my love for this bike. Everyone knows that complaining gets more clicks here on the internet. So what kinds of problems did I have? Well, despite not wanting to ride any of the other bikes in my shed, I only had a few small component nitpicks. First up, with how jumpy this bike can be, I needed to go to a longer travel dropper seat post. My sponsor, PNW Components, makes the 200 millimeter drop externally adjustable loam dropper post which was a great upgrade from the stock 150 millimeter post. I use a full PNW cockpit on all the rest of my bikes, so I swapped those parts over as well, but there is absolutely nothing wrong with the stock cockpit parts. For the wheel set, I didn't even get the stock race face wheels dirty. I threw on my favorite wheels, which are made by another sponsor of mine, Industry 9. I've been using these wheels on all the rest of my bikes this year, and they're what I'm used to. 
They use the Hydra hubs, which have 690 points of engagement, and they're laced to carbon We Are One composite rims. The stock Maxxis tires and the double down casing are really good, but over the last decade, I've primarily been riding WTB tires. I used to work at WTB, and my pals there were kind enough to set me up with a 2.6 Vigilante tough high grip up front and a 2.6 Trail Boss tough fast rolling in the rear. It's worth mentioning that at the neutral geometry setting, my WTB tire combo has slackened the bike out significantly, and it actually measures a 64 degree head tube angle in the neutral geometry position. Yep, the Vigilante 2.6 is that much taller than the Trail Boss, resulting in a much slacker than stock geometry. The stock Shimano XDR group set is the same as what I have on a few of my own bikes and performed as you'd expect. Even with the long 170 millimeter crank arms, I didn't find myself catching too many pedals. The X2 rear shock worked fine and the 38 fork felt downright amazing. While initially I thought the stiffness would be the main difference between the 38 and the 36, instead, I noticed a vastly improved small bump compliance. The biggest problem I had with the bike was with the stock headset. While riding up in the backcountry of Alaska, the headset would be loose in various positions, then tight in others. This is exactly what happens when bearings are going out. As soon as I got home, I threw in a Cane Creek 40 series headset, but after a couple more months, that headset too is having similar issues, creaking more than my pelvis on a rainy morning. Oh, I missed the trail, my little hop. Since these issues happened after sustained riding, I simply think the burly long travel fork and lengthy wheelbase allow for bigger impacts than what these headsets are really rated for. Not a huge deal as a decent Chris King or Cane Creek 110 series unit will fix this, but worth mentioning. That's it, not really a whole lot of issues at all. Sorry guys. Now, before I'm done praising this bike, I wanna mention the carbon layup of the frame. The rear end has a bit of flex to it. Not so much that it felt sketchy, but just enough that it seemed more forgiving when traction is low. Now, the front triangle is quite stiff. The resulting ride characteristic of the bike is really pleasant, stiff where you want it and forgiving where it needs to be. Now, what you all are kind of asking me to talk about is how this thing compares to the Ibis Ritmo V2. Ibis sponsored me last year and I used to work there back in the day and I definitely enjoy riding Ibis bikes. The Altitude is a noticeably bigger bike, better suited for steeper or more rugged trails. It's also more suited for a riding style like my own. The Rocky suspension excels in the parts of the ride where I want my bike to perform best. That's landings, popping, and cornering. While both bikes pedal well with no noticeable bobbing, the Ibis will pedal on a smooth climb a little more efficiently. On the flip side, the Rocky has more available traction while pedaling, and I found myself making it up a few more technical climbs that really surprised me. On the descents, the DW Link is a little more forgiving on the square edged impacts, but that will often mean going really fast through the rough and then getting kind of sketched out, having to deal with 15 millimeters less travel on those bigger impacts. I noticed the requisite body positioning in corners is pretty different between the Rocky and the Ritmo. With the shorter wheelbase and steeper head angle of the Ritmo, I have to get my weight much further back in the corners. On the Rocky, I stay more centered. I can't pump the Rocky quite as well as I can the Ritmo, but when I'm not putting in 100% effort, the turns are a little more predictable on the Rocky Mountain, and that's great when I'm getting fatigued at the end of a long backcountry ride. If I had to give you an analogy between these two great but very different bikes, it would be this. The Ripmo is the Toyota Tacoma of the mountain bike world. It's a great option for just about everyone and just about every location. It can get a little rowdy, but you can still commute with it daily in comfort. Now the Rocky Mountain is a bit more like the Ford Raptor. It'll be more adept in the extreme situations, but you'll also have a much bigger vehicle the rest of the time. I'm a terrible bike reviewer as I have a very unusual riding style and I tend to only ride the gnarliest best trails. What works for me here in Bellingham is not necessarily what's going to work in flatter, mellower terrain. But I'm not here to tell you what to ride, I'm here to tell you what my experience has been like with this bike. And this bike feels a lot like my soulmate. Before you go, don't forget to check out all the details on this bike over at Jensen USA via the link below. And if you enjoyed this video, please do hit that subscribe button below. 
These videos wouldn't be possible without all of your support. So thank you for joining me today. Yes! Oh. Oh. Good? Yeah. Was it harder landing than I expected though?